Mr. Gustin, lead us in the pledge. Please rise, put your hand over your heart. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This time we'll observe a moment of silence. Madam Secretary, call the roll, please. House Chef? Here. Gustin? Here. Zadra? Here. Spraza? Here. Dorch? Here. Ayazi? Absent? Cashel? Here. Approval of the agenda for February 17th? Okay. Have a motion, second. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. Public comment cards? Mr. Guy Felton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Guy Felton, publisher of GrillGov.com. Last Saturday's Sparks Tribune has an article on its front page declaring county's water contamination boundary being reviewed. 508 Sparks parcels could be added to affected area. Sparks Tribune last Saturday, contaminated water. The Trekkie Meadows area has contaminated groundwater, at least in many locations. Ken Stover ran against Dick Gamick last fall for the position of Washoe District Attorney, but lost. Stover's campaign website is still online. Here's what Ken says about our groundwater in part. Quote, the residents of the Truckee Meadows currently are paying a tax to pay for the cleanup of the PCE contamination in our water supply. PCE is a dry cleaning chemical that is highly carcinogenic. Currently, the project is costing the taxpayers $30 million. Three years ago, an environmental lawyer offered Mr. Gamick his services in litigating this PCE contamination against the chemical manufacturers of PCE. He had previously filed a similar suit on behalf of the citizens of Modesto, California. In that lawsuit, the court ordered that the PCE remediation was the responsibility of the chemical manufacturers. Besides being ordered to clean the water and rebuild the Modesto municipal water supply, the chemical, uh, chemical companies were ordered to pay an additional $100 million in punitive damages. Mr. Gamak refused the offer, stating that the Truckee River cleanup was already being financed by the taxpayers, so it was not an issue he cared to discuss. Callous to the needs of the citizens, and inconsiderate to the taxpayers, Mr. Gamick chose not to make our community safer. End of quote. On behalf of Truckee Meadows residents, I ask you council members to call on Dick Gamick to undergo a credible polygraph examination regarding this question. Dick, did you take a bribe from the chemical companies that contaminated our groundwater to let them off the hook. You council members are asked to do right by Washoe taxpayers and do whatever is necessary to have Dick take a credible polygraph. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Sam Denay. Sam Denay, the Encyclopedia of Reno Government and the most trusted name in Nevada government. Well, Mr. Cashel is trusted, too. I didn't want to leave that out. But uh, I'm an Air Force Academy graduate. I spent many years flying fighters and bombers, defending our nation against all kinds of problems. And I've been coming to these city council meetings since 1994. I think it was just after Jessica Safaraza got out of high school. And I've been to these podiums at last count 4,785 times trying to warn you, warn our government, warn the citizens, warn the staff, warn the police, warn the fire people, warn the, the, the people who make sure that you pay your meters when you go out there and park your cars. Been warning you over and over again about the problems that we have in this community. And had, had, had you had listened to Sam, and had the media, even if you didn't want to listen to me, if at least the media had had the courage and the gumption to report Sam's truth in, instead of being uh, deathly afraid and, of, and jealous of Sam's honesty and protection of freedom of speech, we wouldn't be in this terrible pickle. You wouldn't be laying off dozens, dozens, dozens of policemen and firemen. And now I find out you're laying off all the people who go down there and make sure that people don't double and triple park and overextend their stay in front of the businesses. And now they're all being laid off. Uh, and now nobody's going to check if you're going to pay for your car when you're parked out there. Unless maybe, I don't think the mayor's going to go out. Are you going to go out and check the cars and make sure they're not disobeying the meters? Or Mr. Gustin or Mr. Dorch? I don't, I don't, I don't think the city manager's going to wander around making sure that they're not over-parking and taking up spaces that other citizens might want, disobeying the law. And I know the police aren't going to waste their time doing that. No siree. So that's terrible. And I can tell, them, I can tell by the tone of the mayor's voice that he's not in a good mood tonight. You can join Sam on that part. Well, he's saying he is in a good mood. <laughs> At any rate, uh, I was talking with my friends and admirers the other day, talking to them extensively about how Sam could ever become elected to the city council or even to the county commission or governor or president. And, they, and both of my friends, both of them told me, both of them told me, there's only one way you're going to ever do that, Sam. There's only, you've been trying all these years. Your name's been on the ballot probably 35 times, and there's only one way you're going to be able to, to get elected to a government position in Reno, Nevada. And I said, how's that? And he said, they said, you're going to have to change your name. <laughs> change my name? And they said, I said, well, what should I change my name to? I'm, what do you reckon? Oh, this, that's a very simple answer, Sam. The, you change your name to Bob Cashel <laughs> or Sammy Safaraza. Thank you very much. I think you do have another name, but I won't bring it up tonight. <laughs> All right. We'll close the public. <laughs> We'll close public comment. We'll bring it back to item A5. Discussion, potential direction to staff regarding the proposed state legislation and other matters relating thereto. Good morning or good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the council. Since you start about 6 in the morning, it might be morning now. <laughs> <laughs> They're running together these days. Yeah. Um, as I reported last week, things are moving very quickly um, at the legislature. Uh, the legislators are, are not wasting any time getting um, through the many, many bills that they have before them this session. Uh, to their credit, they, they have buckled down and gotten right to work. Um, so I have a brief update for you today. Um, submitted a staff report this morning. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to review that, so I will briefly go through these items and would be pleased to answer any questions. Um, we are in the second week of the legislature. Um, when I wrote this report last evening, 350 bills uh, had been read and referred to committee. Uh, as I reported last week, that does include all three of the City of Reno's bills. Um, and as of last evening, uh, we are tracking 636 bills or BDRs uh, for potential impact to the City of Reno. 
Uh, I will mention um, that in addition to bills being heard, there have been a number of presentations. Uh, committee chairmen have been taking this first week or so to educate uh, their committees on the topics that they'll be understanding, learning more about this session, um, particularly important given all the freshmen uh, legislators that we have. Um, that did include a presentation uh, that the mayor and our city manager made uh, to Assembly Government Affairs last Friday morning um, and did get compliments from the chairwoman on our presentation and thanked her. Her. She thanked us once again for coming down. Um, and then this morning, uh, Mr. Hester gave a presentation to Assembly Taxation uh, relating to star bonds. Um, got a lot of good questions. Um, there was quite a lot of dialogue. Um, the City of Sparks gave a presentation uh, on their star, star bond project this morning as well. Um, so with that, I will go quickly into a review of uh, the City of Reno's bills. Um, I, I do have the unfortunate duty of reporting to you that uh, we have had to withdraw one of our bills, AB 52, uh, the bill relating to unemployment uh, compensation for our seasonal employees. Uh, we were contacted by the Department of Employment Training and Rehabilitation uh, and advised that they had serious concerns uh, with the bill and its compliance with the Social Security Act of 1935. Um, that there are conformity issues with uh, that federal legislation that would not allow us uh, to give lesser benefits to uh, public employees than what uh, is in the private sector. We had written the bill just to be for our employees and unfortunately um, we, we were not in compliance with federal law so we have had to withdraw that bill. Um, our other two bills are still awaiting a hearing. Um, and with that, I will move on to the League of Cities bills. Um, with the exception of one of those bills, um, all of them are still awaiting a hearing. AB 68 uh, will be heard tomorrow morning in Assembly Government Affairs. Uh, that is actually the bill that we brought forward uh, during the League conference that relates to property sales and leasing. Uh, so I will be testifying on behalf of that bill in the morning. Um, we've met with uh, members of the committee and feel that we do have good support. Uh, the chairwoman indicated this morning that there have have been some parties come forward with amendments. We have not seen those yet, uh, but we'll certainly be working with any parties that are looking for amendments on that uh, and look to move that bill forward. Uh, an update on the bill that I brought to you last week, uh, SB 124, that's Senator Keekheffer's bill uh, regarding to, uh, city services um, and our ability to displace or limit competition on that. I would thank Councilman Dorch for coming uh, down to the legislature yesterday morning and he did a fantastic job um, with answering questions of that committee. Uh, and we are hopeful uh, that Senator Lee will uh, allow us to do a work session on that bill uh, to address some of the issues that were raised. Primarily his concern was um, ensuring public input um, and during our testimony we assured him um, that that we were not looking to take anything behind closed doors, um, that we were simply looking for more flexibility with our operations. So um, as soon as we get word that there's been a work session scheduled for that, we'll be certain to let you know. And again, thank you, Councilman Dorch, for your help there yesterday morning. Um, the other bill uh, that I would mention, um, Mayor Cashel, uh came and spoke in favor of, I believe it was Monday morning, uh, AB 144 that's been getting a lot of media attention. That's the uh, Nevada First Jobs Bill uh, that relates to public works projects and puts some requirements on it. Um, and I think it's very much aligned with um, the council's previously stated intentions of giving preference to local companies and local bidders. And so uh, we have indicated our support for that bill. Um, it did go for a vote on the assembly floor today and um, I believe that it passed, but I don't have that information for sure. It was happening as I was leaving the building to come back down here. So um, I believe that that vote did take place today um, and it was expe expected to pass uh, and be sent over to the Senate for them to hear it. Um, in addition to that, one other bill of interest uh, that was heard yesterday, SB 135, which was brought forth by Senator Rhodes. Um, it relates to uh, presumption of el eligibility for certain occupational diseases um, better known as heart lung. Uh, it was a very tense hearing um, and uh, a lot of good discussion um, from both the opposition and the supporters. Uh, the committee chair created a subcommittee uh, to work with uh, the parties that came forward yesterday to see if there is a path forward on this bill and that perhaps uh, there can be some amendments that would address the concerns of those that were in opposition um, and there is a possibility at least at this point for a work session on that so I will be monitoring that very closely. Uh, we did sign in in support of the bill as it was currently written um, and I, 
would also note in the staff report two other things coming up. Um, next week, Senator Harry Reid will uh, address uh, the legislature. Uh, that will be at 11 a.m. on Tuesday, the 22nd. Um, and then once again, we'll just put in a little plug for our legislative breakfast next Friday morning at 7 a.m. And with that, I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Any questions? Any members? Ms. Fraser. Uh, what's going on, Cadence, with SB 169? The um, the legislation regarding uh, the seniority of layoffs. I didn't see that in your report. Uh, it is not in my report at this point. It has not been scheduled for a hearing. Um, we just got the language on that yesterday, um, so we are reviewing it. Um, I've, I've sent it to uh, Human Resources and um, the Attorney's Office for their input, um, and, and I'm awaiting that. I would anticipate that we will be taking a position on that. Uh, as well once we've had a chance to analyze it for impacts to us. Because I, I think that could be extremely problematic because how would you do it? Then you would have this body making those decisions, which... Um, yeah, my understanding is that it, um, that it strikes that. Um, and, and is it SB 162 perhaps that you're referring to? It was BDR 788. It would be, I'm looking I can here. double check. I, I have SB 162 on our tracking list and it. And it 169 it says. Okay, I, I'll, I'll double check on that. 162 is the one that we got the language on yesterday. Um, the, the bulk of the bill does deal primarily with employees of school districts, um, but there was one little sentence in there that did strike uh, the, um, the the process for reduction in force uh, as a mandatory subject of collective bargaining. Um, it does strike that um, from the subject of collective bargaining and again forwarded that to the attorney's office and to human resources for their review and input. Yeah, what the bill says is it would prohibit any government agency from giving, let's see, preference um, to workers with more years of service in order of layoffs. And it, it specifically local governments okay. is what it says. I will certainly follow up on that councilwoman and we'll get you an update. Mr. Dorch. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, are, are we aware of a bill, another elections bill from uh, Senator Leslie? We are, it's, it's a BDR at this point. We have not seen the bill language. Um, the information that I've been given is that the bill will not be specific to the city of Reno. Um, that it will be a statewide bill requiring um, that elections uh, for local government uh, bodies, uh, that the members of the body be elected by ward in the general election, and that that would be the case for all cities, uh, not just ours. There are some cities that already operate that way, um, and, and at this point, that, that's all I know. We've we've requested the full information and have not been provided you that yet. You guys wouldn't have to run citywide. Give me a. There's break. only one person at this table it'll apply to. So. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> oh, we're not going to let you off that easy. <laughs> Question. Uh, yes, Mr. Ashup. On the um, on our on AB 52, did we? How did that work? Did we just get a phone call? Uh, from the bad unemployment, or did we confirm that we were arguably in violation of federal law? Um, it, it, yes, it's, and, um, essentially we got a phone call, um, you know, through through the chairman of the committee that was scheduled to hear the the bill. Um, he contacted me and and let me know that he had been contacted by Dieter, um, and that they had expressed concerns that they were expecting a letter from the Department of Labor um, that would support their belief. Um, I. I then contacted Dieter myself, um, spoke with the head of the unemployment division, and had him provide us some information. Um, and we, we did, you know, it, w it was a quick review because the chairman said to us, you know, essentially, if, if you've got this fatal flaw in your bill, um, you know, either get it fixed overnight or we're going to hear the bill and, and, you know, all of this is going to come out as part of the testimony tomorrow. So um, I contacted our attorney's office. We reviewed the information uh, that Dieter had provided and confirmed that, in fact, the information that they were providing to us was correct. Okay. Uh, can I get a copy of that? Yes, sir. And then on the Starbond project, the testimony, what, what, what kind of testimony was provided? Uh, 
We provided a, an overview of, um, of star bonds, a, a short history on the legislation. Um, again, a part of this was, an, it was uh, Chairwoman Kirkpatrick of Assembly Taxation. She's also the Chairwoman of Assembly Government Affairs. She has seven freshmen on her committee, so she's been doing a lot of educational. So a lot of it was some background information. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Hester provided details on uh, the, the three districts that we have, the two projects that we've completed, um, they asked a number of questions about uh, the, the process, the preponderance studies. Um, so it, it was educational. Um, as Is there a pending BDR with respect to uh, yes, star bonds? Yes, absolutely, and, at least and, one. And what's the um, gist of that? Uh, I, I believe we'll see a very similar uh, bill to the bill that uh, Assemblywoman Smith brought forward in the last session, um, and potentially we would also see one that would seek to eliminate uh, star bonds altogether with. Okay. All right. That's all, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Keep us posted on that because we want to. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Custon? Ms. Frazzle? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sam Dene. Sam Dene, the Encyclopedia Arena Government and Air Force Academy graduate who spent the last 17 years of his life coming to these government meetings to try to keep the city out of the terrible pickle it has gotten itself into, but it looks like it's way too late for that. And um, I'm here to a couple of, talk about a couple of these things. I noticed that this one concerning, uh, and I don't, this is kind of, strange wording it, it certainly sounds anti-citizenry on the outset and maybe she can explain it a little again it says this uh, sb 124 and i can imagine that former reno Re gazette regurgitator reporter who's now parlayed his reporting into being a senator of all bizarre things senator k he's recommending that we um a bill expand the areas in which the governing body of an incorporated city may displace or limit competition by removing the requirement that a service otherwise authorized by law to be provided by the city must also be demanded by the inhabitants of the city. Well, what if the inhabitants of the city mm -hmm. want to demand it? You're not going to allow them to, to, to demand these things anymore? It's or else there's a whole bunch of double negatives there. The, the bill just sounds quite disconjurcutigulated, and since it came from Keegan Kiefer, I can see why it's disconjurcutigulated. Also, I wanted to make a quick comment about this um, um, making temporary government employees ineligible for unemployment compensation. It says here the status is withdrawn. I don't know who withdrew it, but I think that's a good thing. If a person if a person works for a living down here or for the government or the city and temporarily or not and they get laid off through no fault of their own, they should be eligible for unemployment compensation. For those who don't remember, unemployment compensation is actually an insurance. Even though the person may not be paying the insurance himself or herself, it is an insurance because they generally get a lower pay because you folks or the government or the private company has to pay into the insurance fund. So indirectly, the person is paying for it himself and herself. And I'm glad that you took that off of the books. By the way, oh, quite a coincidental thing, this young lady over here. Finally, we have two people in the audience. Two people in the audience. Everybody else's staff and, of course, these people losing their jobs. But this young lady was in the hallway out there and heard me talking, heard Sam talking, and she was so inspired she said, I'm going to come in here and listen. And she said she's going to come to the podium next time she's at a medium. And this is really kind of coincidental because guess why she's down here? One of them, one of those people, it's their fault. She got a parking ticket. <laughs> she came down to pay her parking ticket. I said, well, if this had happened today or yesterday, nobody would catch her. She'd be free to go. But she, it was three, three weeks ago, and she got busted by... One of these parking people here. What a coincidence. Anyway, um, good luck. Thank you very much. She probably couldn't believe what she was hearing, so she but I mean, never mind. Um, she used the word inspired. Close the public comment. Let's have an acceptance of the report on AB5. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Now we'll go to item A6.
City Manager's report, financial and operational matters, discussion, potential direct and staff. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, what this is on here um, to do is to update you on the, on the discussions that have been going on with the bargaining units. You directed the manager to meet with the bargaining units relative to the possibility of, um, of retaining the staff that were prepared to be laid off. Laid off. I've gone over that in detail with you um, at a labor session. All have come to the table. Some are committed to try. Uh, others are still evaluating. Um, we are going to be uh, going back and verifying the numbers and getting back with those about those various groups um, to see if we can not only cover the cost of 10, 11, but of 11 and 12 as well. Um, so what we will do is uh, keep you posted as we continue to work, but all um, of them have met with me within the last two, two days. And as I said, um, some are committed to try. Uh, others are still evaluating what they, what they wanna do. Um, one, one group is, has, has said that they may not they don't believe that they can make it, um, but the others have given us numbers and are trying, and we're going to verify and go back with the full cost to do that. Any questions? Councilman Sprague. Um, yeah, I had asked questions regarding the overtime um, and wanted to see if we had those answers. Um, I've been asking for quite some time because um, I do have some questions regarding that under this agenda item. Um, Actually, um, we have data that has been collected and we will get the data out to you. Um, what we were planning on doing is doing a full presentation at the next meeting regarding the, um, the various items that the council had asked. Uh, I know that that data has been coming in to uh, Mr. Good. Um, I will have him get that data out. Well, I guess today it, it goes to my concern with uh, the original um, motions that we made and looking at at what we're doing as far as rifts, specifically in fire, because we're letting go 36 employees, doesn't make sense to me when we have $2 million in overtime. How that overtime is going to increase, essentially, if we get rid of 36 more bodies. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm just concerned that I don't have that answer yet, where that overtime's being driven from. Why won't we cut off the overtime completely? I mean, it doesn't make sense to me what was in the budget presentation that we're going forward and we're going to do 36 rifts in that department when we have two million in overtime as it stands. Why wouldn't we eliminate overtime completely? I still haven't gotten that answer. I'll, I'll give you the answer right now. Um, essentially, what has happened is when we came to the council last year, we said um, with the reductions in force that we were going to do, we would have to close and, and roll or brown out in certain stations along that line. Um, we asked for a reduction in staffing levels to a, certain, to a certain level that the council approved in terms of the impact to the public. Um, I, when we dropped below that, we did bring people back to maintain the level of protection we had told council we would maintain. So that is part of that, that, is part of that overtime. If we were not to have, to have done some of the overtime, we would have been browning out other stations. And I guess we could have come back to the council and said, is it okay to brown out additional stations? But, um, but, but we, did not, we did not do that. But that goes to my point because now we're at a stage now where we're gonna have to brown, for the next four months, why won't we cut it off, do more rolling brownouts than having permanent closures? Because you're gonna have, now we're, we're going to the 36, and you're going to have more permanent closures. It, it Council Member Sparraza, we will bring that, sense to me. bring that back at our next meeting um, and tell you what, in order to uh, cut out the overtime in its entirety, what that would take. We'll have it for you at the next meeting. I, I, and I want to make sure this question's answered, Mr. Mayor, and I'm going to put it on Chief, the record again. Chief, could you come up just a minute? And thank you, sir. If, if we, to me, it defeats the very purpose if we were to, because by, by laying off additional 36 firefighters, we're gonna be essentially closing out more stations than we currently are right now, correct? Uh, for the record, Mike Hernandez, Reno Fire Chief, what our plan is entailing is browning out one additional station and then reducing staffing levels at two multi-company stations. We are not, the only station that we're gonna add to the list of brownouts is, uh, is one, correct? Okay, so if we were to eliminate overtime now, 
then we, because by having 36 firefighters less, it seems to me those overtime numbers would be driven up. Or I, we would have station closures actually, if you were backfilling. The, the plan is to maintain our existing overtime line item budget and, and to compensate with the additional brand out of the station and then the reduction of those two additional multi-company crews. Uh, we would have to cost out if we actually zeroed out our overtime budget, uh, what that impact would mean, um, you know, as, as part of our cost of doing business, if you will, council member, um, when we brown out, there is a, there is a savings. And I know that, um, but Chief, my question is then why aren't we doing that right now? Why aren't we bringing forward a proposal to council right now to, to, do these um, additional brownouts if possible so we're, so we're saving actual bodies. Why isn't that being brought to us for the next? We, we can look at it. I'll bring that up. At we'll the next meeting. It. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh -huh. Any other question and discussion? Mr. Custin? Uh, no public comment. I, I guess the other question is, Mrs. Manager, is we have CSOs here in the audience. Um, that was the other thing that was brought up was the, and I don't think we ever got the answer to it, Councilman Zodder started that discussion. And, yeah. and what is the structure happening now since Friday? Are, are we still gonna have um, those positions doing revenue collections? Um, yeah. How is that working now? Council Member Sferraza, what we had said and what Council had agreed to um, at the at the last meeting was for staff to come back with that presentation at the next council meeting we this was to be an update on the collective bargaining um, and we will be prepared um, the chief is is gone for a couple of days I plan on sitting down with him and getting I don't I don't have that answer today but this, the plan was for us to come back with police with fire and with uh, parks and recreation at the next regularly scheduled meeting so, which would be three days before the first, or actually a day before the first now, a day before the first now. But um, I guess um, for information, um, since that's all it is, that's not how it was agendized, but with our collective bargaining units, Mr. Mayor, so the public's aware what's going on is we are trying to work with them. They've offered us some concessions. We don't know if those meet the gap and, and some of them, quite frankly, don't nope, fill the hole to save the employees this year. So we're hoping that that's gonna happen. I believe the CSOs are part of uh, the bargaining unit that does not wanna make concessions for this fiscal year. So um, I think that needs, we need to let the public know that. Um, and um, some of the others, so you would have to talk to your group about that um, because we can't, intervene in that but I think we do need to let the public know that we are working on it that some of the numbers um, have to be verified some units um, like fire are trying to save I believe five um, the police are coming forward with potentially saving 11 um, but that's just for this fiscal year and we still have the issue for next fiscal year right. and I don't know how much I can say at this meeting for the attorneys but it's very frustrating because want to let people know what's going on, that we're trying to work with, with all of our bargaining units. And then I, I, do, I did receive an email, um, and what I would like, and I assume this is coming back to us, but just in case, this distinction between CSO 1 and 2s and who actually mm -hmm. generates the revenue, maybe if staff, finance staff could drill down on that, um, uh, because obviously if they're paying for themselves, then it makes sense to to keep CSOs. And then the other thing, and we've had this conversation before, and I think I mentioned it at the, um, a couple of meetings ago, to me it's important that when we sit down with our collective bargaining groups that we have a frank discussion about, you know, the, what the number is, the target number, and then also all of the benefits that they receive and the cost of those benefits. <clears throat> and, and ultimately there's some so that gives them an idea of what they can pick and choose 
technically what they need to give up in order to hit that target number. And I know, Ms. City Manager, you're saying that that may not fully address the problem. Then staff really needs to have a con candid conversation with a compounding that we have, whether it be salary or PERS, et cetera. But it seems to me that there's a compromise in there someplace where staff can hit, you know, some of the target uh, with salary, maybe in salary freezes. But there are other benefits that I understand that uh, collective bargaining units are willing to give up that would, would certainly go a long ways in hitting that target number. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Anything else? Chair will entertain a motion to accept the report. I have a motion second. All in favor say aye. Those that oppose, no. Motion carries unanimously. I have a motion to adjourn. The second. All in favor say aye. Those that oppose, no. Motion carries unanimously.